do uh, rapid fire preaching, so I'll talk fast if you can listen fast, okay? Stand with me and turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. I thought about a couple titles to this message. <clears throat> One could be God is not a socialist. Amen? Hebrews chapter number 11. You'll see that here in just a second. He goes, compares the offerings that are given to him. And he looks at one as being more excellent than the other, all right? Um, but uh, I think what we're looking at here is a more excellent sacrifice by faith. A more excellent sacrifice by faith. Hebrews chapter number 11, and uh, we'll start reading here in verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. Bella, can you give me some water, please? Thank you. Uh, Hebrews 11, in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <clears throat> For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, look at this, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, anoint my lips. Lord, I pray that my mind and my, my heart would be clean, would be right with you, Lord. I pray that you would lead and guide what is said. Lord, we want to surrender this service to you. Lord, I pray that you are pleased with our giving, with our singing. Lord, uh, with uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to see what Brother Tanner has been up to over there in Germany and for the opportunity for us to be a help and to, to try to be a blessing to him on his way. Lord, thank you for the time that, that he did have here with us and the help he was to our church. And Lord, I pray you use him many times over for uh, several years to come. Lord, uh, thank you for the example of, of Cain and Abel. Lord, thank you for the example of a more excellent sacrifice. Lord, help us to look at our lives or to understand that what you want isn't really our wallet, or you want us. And I pray that we could be that living sacrifice, Lord, by faith that you're looking for. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. There in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4, uh, you read that there is such a thing as a more excellent sacrifice. Thank you. A more excellent sacrifice. You know what that tells me? God doesn't look at every sacrifice the same. Some sacrifices aren't given the right way. Matter of fact, the Lord in the Old Testament, uh, He has a problem when there are certain people that offer up strange fire before the Lord. God does not just take anything. Look, God is not goodwill. Amen? You go through your closet sometimes, you go, you know what? I don't want this anymore. I'm going to dump it at the thrift store. That is not how you treat God. God deserves the best that you have. And in our society, and, and as people, it, it amazes me how, how much emphasis we will put in time and resources into renovating a house, or, or, or into our cars, or into our whatever. And when it comes to God, it's like, okay, God, here's what I got left over. Enjoy. Hey, that's not how it works with the Lord. As a matter of fact, Cain brought the best that he thought he could do for God, and it wasn't by faith. And God said, because it wasn't by faith, and you didn't listen to what I said. I don't, come on, parents, you ever have kids that do something halfway, or they do something their own way, and, and you say, well, that's not what I asked you to do. And then they go, but I did something. <laughs> well, yeah, you did, but you didn't do it the way I asked you to do it. You didn't do it in good faith. What is good faith? Good faith is looking at what God says and living by it and doing it how he said it to be done. You think about the example of Saul in the Old Testament. Saul wanted to bring the best of the Amalekites and offer it before the Lord. Did God take it? No. You say, why? Because that's not what God wanted. That was not a more excellent sacrifice. That was his idea of what a sacrifice should have been. But I want you to see here that God does compare the two. He says that Abel's offering is a more excellent sacrifice than Cain's. Cain's wasn't accepted because it wasn't by faith. Now you understand this, there is nothing that you can offer to God for your salvation. If you're here today and you are trying to get saved 
by giving to God, you can't give enough. You'll never give enough to be saved. Amen? Aren't you glad your salvation does not rest in you doing something, but rather in what Jesus Christ already did? Now look, that's salvation. Salvation is free. And there's no strings attached. I've had people that you go through the, the Bible, the biblical plan of salvation, and you get to the end, you go, now let me ask you a question. Will you, will you be willing to receive this? And some of them will go, well, you know, I don't know if I can live it. Now look, I'm glad that when I got saved, it was not determined on whether I could live it. Amen? Or I would have been lost and in hell a long time ago. I'm glad my salvation's free. But can I say this? Salvation is free, but your Christianity, your Christian life is not. Understand, you being saved and you being a follower of Jesus Christ are two separate things. And oftentimes, modern churches blend the two together. So you can't tell if the invitation is for a saved person to get right with God or a lost person to receive the gift of eternal life. I like to draw a really wide distinction between the two. I like to say, look, salvation is free. The Christian life and being a disciple of Jesus Christ is going to cost you something. And there are going to be times in your life where you are called to sacrifice for the Lord. Now, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Go there with me if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as you turn there, keep in mind the author of Hebrews speaks in regards to this excellent sacrifice and says, God testifying of his gifts. Who is the his? It's Abel's. God testified to the gift, the, the offering, the sacrifice. And those, those words are used to describe each other. It's a sacrifice and it's a gift. And he brings that before God. Christian, you know what you're doing every single day? You are deciding whether or not you are going to be a living sacrifice for Jesus Christ. And, and I want you to get this and understand this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul speaks of this and he says here in verse number 9, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Understand that you in, in, in Christ, as far as your salvation is concerned, in your position in Jesus Christ, you are accepted in the beloved. Amen? You know what? You may not find acceptance out there, but you are accepted in Jesus Christ. Regardless of where you've been or what you've done, that's a blessing. And you know what? You may find the world rejects you and your family rejects you, but you have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's your salvation. But as it relates to your service and your sacrificing and your giving of yourself to God, there are times where it's accepted and there's times where it's not. You say, how do you know? Because Paul says what he says there. We labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And the context is the judgment seat of Christ. There are times where there are things that you will bring to God and he's just going, look, I don't necessarily want that because you didn't do it in faith. You didn't do it how I said. I know that doesn't always sound nice. We like to think that God's just going to be happy with whatever. It doesn't matter how we do it, whether it's according to the word of God. We do it our way, his way. It doesn't matter. It does matter. And there is something to be said about bringing a sacrifice the right way by faith. So it's accepted of him. Can I ask you a question? Don't you want to get to glory and hear him say, well done? Don't you want to hear him say, when you bring your kids and you put your kids before the Lord, he says, well done. When you put before him the job that you had for the last 20 years, and he, he looks at the time and the, the way that you worked, and you worked not for men and for eye-pleasing, but to serve the Lord, and he wants, don't you want to hear him say, well done? Don't you want to see that, Lord, look, this was my, my opportunity to serve and be a part of New Heights Baptist Church, and Lord, this was my contribution. Don't you want to hear him say, well done? Sacrificial giving, let me say this, it's a reflection of God's character. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's an expression of our faith. It's necessary to live a Christian life. You know what Paul says in Philippians? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of, Je of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. You know what he's saying? There have been some things in my life that I have given up. You know what? That's okay. That is nothing compared to the glory which shall be. 
David says that he won't sacrifice anything that doesn't cost him something. Sacrificial giving pleases God. You say, why? Because it's by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I'll say this. The reason marriages suffer, the reason churches are falling apart, the reasons that ministries fail is because of a lack of sacrifice. You know, what's, you know what our generation is marked with? Look at me. I'm number one. You know what? I'm getting out of this marriage because she didn't meet my needs and she didn't uh, uh, meet, uh, meet me halfway and she couldn't uh, uh, help me with this. And she, and in other words, it's all their fault. They weren't there for me. Hey, understand, you're supposed to be there for them. <laughs> That's your job. Look, as it relates to your service for Jesus Christ, it is not all about us. There's a, there, he is supposed to be at the center. You know what that means? If he's at the center, it's going to cost me something. How much are you willing to sacrifice for Jesus Christ? Now, I'm, I'm talking to folks that, for the most part, most of you have never lived without electricity. Most of you, now some of you may have, but most of you have never lived without running water. Most of you have never lived without, you know, the, uh, the ease of, especially the generation we live in, you push a button and food comes to your door. <laughs> Man. When we talk about sacrificing, you know what our generation thinks of? When we talk about sacrificing, I'm going to get up at 6.30 instead of 7 to read my Bible. Whew. Now look, I, I joke about that, but for some of you that might be a big deal. You know what I tell you? Start there. <laughs> and work from there. Your life as a Christian is supposed to be about sacrifice. And you know what God says? The Bible says that God testified of the gifts of Abel. I can't prove this doctrinally. But I think there's something to be said. In, in the Old Testament, there are times where people are offering a sacrifice to God, and God's testimony or God's testament that he accepted it was the fire came down and took up the offering. And I wonder if what took place, because after all, in Genesis chapter 4, it, sort of, it doesn't tell you that's what happened. It just says that God had respect on Abel's offering. You want God to accept your sacrifice, don't you? He had respect on Abel's offering, but to Cain's he did not. Now, how would Cain have known that God had respect on Abel's offering unless there was a way to see something that took place there? I believe the fire came down. That was God's way of saying, you know what we need today? We need God's fire to come down. You want God to say, I am pleased with that sacrifice. I am pleased with what you're bringing me. Because after all, like I said, God's not goodwill. We don't bring the leftovers. We bring the best. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And if I could find a group of people that understood a more excellent sacrifice, it would be some Macedonian Christians. And I want to talk to you about a more excellent sacrifice by faith. Great picture that you see there with Abel. And New Testament application of this, you might say, is this, these churches of Macedonia. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wait of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, this is going to rock your world, <laughs> right? You say, why? Because here you see that they are joyful in their poverty. The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abound in the riches of their liberality. God can take poverty and turn it into riches. <laughs> Now, that is not the prosperity gospel. Time out. I am not trying to tell you, you give $5 to God, He's going to give you 500 and you just plant your seed of faith, and there'll be, five, there'll be so much money flowing out of this place. That is not what I'm talking about. That garbage that's on TV, watch out for that. There are people that are get, getting Christians to send their money to these people that are living high the hog, low the chicken, and they don't care about those people at all. They're sucking the money. They're siphoned for God's money that should be going to local churches to help people get saved. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is God looking at you saying, God, I don't have a lot to offer. I don't have as much as this person. Lord, I don't have the talents that this person has. I don't have the time that this person has. I don't have the treasure this person has. Now let me just use Brother Tanner if I can for a second this morning. And, and, and sincerely, I appreciate what he's doing. Let me tell you this. It might be easy at times for a guy who's got a family, he got the kids, go, man, if I was single and I had nothing to take care of outside of my family, look at all that I could do for God. 
And you know what he could do if he's not careful? He could look at the guy that's married and go, man, I really wish I had a wife. Because I could really serve God in these areas. You know what? We can do that all day long. You know what's easy to do? Look at what you don't have and say, well, that's how they're able to serve God. God's not worried about that. God will look at your poverty of time, your poverty of talents, your poverty of treasures, and say, you know what? I'll still take it. I'll still take it. God took a, a little boy's lunch and fed 5,000 people. God can take your poverty and turn it into riches of your liberality, your liberality as it relates to giving. God can do that. Paul reached the known world without the American dollar. How about that in his day? The church of Antioch in the first century as a new church sent money back to a more established church. The Lord Jesus Christ turned the world upside down. I would say with a low budget. And by the way, the treasurer in that church was a devil. So he had money going in and money going out, probably not to all the right places. And look at all the things that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was able to accomplish on a low budget. You know what that tells me? It's not about just money. It's about us being willing to give whatever it is that we have, even in our poverty. You know what the poor Christian says, physically, uh, financially poor? When I get rich, when I'm older and, I have, and I'm retired, I'll give more time. When I learn to do these things all the way, then I'll sing in front of everybody, right? You always wait until that time. Hey, can I say this? Even in your deep poverty, God can use you. You may not think you have everything it takes, you may think that your giving is inconsequential, but it's not. Christian, are you allowing your poverty of whatever it may be to keep you from giving? And I don't just mean financially. Sure, that too. But I mean your time. I don't have as much time as this person. I'm not as talented as this person. You might say, man, I am poor. You know what God says? Then I can use you. You know why? Because when you're poor, you know what you have to learn to do? Look at verse number three. When you're poor, you, gotta learn to you have to learn to rely on the power of God. Now, I'm just going to be flat honest with you. When my wife and I first got married, I was making eight fifty. I got all the way to $9 an hour when we first got married in Pensacola, Florida, digging ditches. And I will be honest with you, I'll tell you, there was probably more prayer at that point in our marriage than, than now about praying for our daily bread. I'm ashamed to confess that. You know what happens after a while? Well, I've got money in the bank. Uh, it's okay. Hey, man, let me tell you something right now. That could go away just like that. The same way God has blessed and provided, it could, boom, gone. But you know what was really interesting? There were times we go to the cupboards and there's a can of beans or a box of tuna mac or beef mac, whatever, all right, Lord, this is it until next Tuesday. <laughs> Lord, you got to do something. There was a lot of relying on God's power in our poverty. And you know what's amazing about that? God does that sometimes for a reason. Our country went through a very bad recession a few years ago. You know what I saw with the missionaries? I saw missionaries go from taking a year and a half to taking three to four years to getting to the mission field. And I can tell you, if nothing else, it built some stronger missionaries. You see why? A lot of prayer going on. Look at verse number three. For to their power, talk about offering a more excellent sacrifice. You say, what does that mean? It means that God can take our poverty and turn it to riches. I can say this as well. It demonstrates a more excellent sacrifice by faith demonstrates the power of God. Look at verse three. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. You know what Paul was trying to figure out? How was it these Macedonians who were poor? How did they have the ability? How did they have the strength? How did they have the power? You know what people will do in businesses? They'll go inside of a successful business and go, what is the pattern? How are they able to do this? How can we take this and put it over here? So Paul's looking at it, and he's looking at this church, these churches over here, and he goes, they're poor. They don't have a lot. But man, they gave a lot, and God blessed them. And what was it? How did they have the power to do this? You know what he realized? It was beyond their power, <laughs> as it says in verse 3. You know what God wants to do by faith? He wants to stretch us in areas of our life. Stretch us to where it is beyond your power to fulfill the need of that ministry. It is beyond your power. I can tell you right now, we've got maybe some Sunday school teachers. Can I, can I just use you? I can tell you, I'm sure Miss Angie did not see herself five years ago teaching a Sunday school class. She would say, and Miss, her sister's going, mm -mm. <laughs> Your family always tells on you, amen. You know what that is? It is beyond her power. 
I can tell you with confidence, I did not think, there was a time, and some of you wish I'd shut up sometimes, the first time I preached, after five minutes, I'm going, I'm supposed to go five more minutes, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do, I'm supposed to do this for the rest of my life, God, I think you got the wrong guy, you know what it is, it's beyond my power, it's his, you know what God wants to do in your life, stretch you by faith, so you don't live beyond your power, I read a really interesting story about a man named Herbert Jackson, he's a missionary, and, uh, Got to the foreign field, and, and the car that, that was donated to his ministry there was a car that wouldn't start without you pushing it. And so, honestly, the first thing I thought was, like, Dominican Republic or Cuba, you know, I just see guys, you know, pushing a car. And here, if you see a bunch of Hispanic guys pushing a car, you probably think they're stealing them. Hey, I can say that. I'm one of them, okay? <laughs> All right? But uh, anyways, there, every time he was, he was going to use this car, he'd have to have someone push it. So you know what he did? He went to a local school, and he said, Hey, can I use the kids to help me push this car? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what he did is every time he was driving that car, he'd either leave the engine running or he'd leave it at the top of a hill so he could find some kids that would help him push it. And Brother Elvin's like, I've been there before. I've seen that, you know. Uh, and what's funny is about uh, three years later, I think it was, his family got sick. They had to leave the mission field. So a new missionary comes in, and before he's leaving, Brother Jackson takes him to the car, and he goes, okay, let me tell you about this car. It, it's not fully functional. He says, what do you mean? Well, every time you want to start it, you've got to, you've got to push it. And the guy goes, can I just look under the hood? And he goes, sure. And he looks under the hood. And he goes, ah, there's a loose cable here. <laughs> For two, three years, this guy's doing this the entire time. All it was was a loose cable. Now you say, what does that teach you? There are, and it wasn't connected to the power supply. You know what that shows you as a Christian? You can burn yourself out doing things in your own flesh. Trying to do, trying to do. Hey, I can, even when it comes to giving, I need to give more. I need to do more. I need to. And my wife and I were just talking about this. Man, the, the Bible says my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The Christian life is going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. It should be a sacrifice. But man, it shouldn't be drudgery. You shouldn't look at it and go, oh, church, oh, the Bible, oh, I got to do this. Oh, no, man, I get to do this. I get to give this. Hey, with all the problems that are involved, with the flakiness of people, with people that talk about you behind your back, oh, those things never happen in church or ministry, do they? With, these, with any problems you may have, let me say this, it is still a blessing to serve my God. It is still a blessing to be able to give to my God. It is. And oftentimes, because we're not plugged in to the power of God, we waste years of our life pushing a car that doesn't even need to be pushed. Power's already there. <laughs> We're just not connected right. You know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ? For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. That is good stuff. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. You know what Jesus Christ says? You do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You know what's missing from some of our lives? The power of God. And when it comes to giving a sacrifice, you simply say, I can't. Instead of learning to say, I can't, but he can. You see, when you stretch, when you allow the Lord to stretch you by faith further than you think you can go, you know what it becomes? It becomes beyond your power, and it becomes his working through you. I mentioned this earlier. I don't believe... I mentioned this in Sunday school. Some churches, it's all about you got to do, you got to do, you got to do. And those that are serving, you got to serve more, you got to do more. You gotta, and, and I have had folks come to our church literally burnt out from other ministries. I'm not talking about that. I don't want that here. But I'll say this. There's probably some who aren't allowing God to stretch them far enough. There may be some of you that are saying, I've come to a limit. This is as far as I'm going to go. And if God wants anything else, he's had to get it from somebody else. And you're going to miss out on the power of God. Look at verse number 5. 2 Corinthians 8, look at verse number 5. You know what? A more excellent sacrifice by faith shows, shows a priority. And this they did, not as we hoped, look at this, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. Say, Pastor, are you trying to get at, you know, I need to give more money. Can I say this? This is not what God is supremely interested in. 
I, 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 could, I could give you the, the, pull out the keys to your car. That's not what God is interested in. The keys to your house, that's not what God is interested in. Your bank account, that's not what, God's interested in having you. If the Lord has you and your affections and your desires and your passions, and you learn to give yourself to God, He can do something from there. The priority is not in the wallet. The priority is on you. They first gave their own selves willingly. Look, if you would, at chapter number 5, same book. Look at verse 15. Are you willing to lay yourself on the altar today and say, Lord, I want to give a more excellent sacrifice. And I'm holding back. There are things in my life I know I could use for you. I know I could sacrifice for you. 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 15. That he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth, look at this, live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Over there in Proverbs it says, My son, give me thine heart. You understand there's a lot of things. One of the biggest problems you're going to face today in your life is to learn to prioritize things. One of the biggest reasons why people struggle so badly in work, in family, in church, in any area is because they don't have priorities. It's just sort of, well, I have this to do and I've got, and we're just running from a distraction, one distraction to the next. What is your priority in life today? <laughs> is it to put a smile on God's face truly? To sacrifice yourself to Him? I read a story about a lighthouse. I don't know much about lighthouses. I try to stay away from the water. Amen. But I know that uh, in the olden days, those lighthouses, they weren't electric. They were uh, flamed. At the, or they were fueled by oil. And what they would do is they would bring enough oil to last for that month for that lighthouseman to keep that light shining on the coast. And a true story, uh, I think it was in the... Uh, um, New England, where a man who was that lighthouse when was given that oil, and a farmer came by and said, uh, hey, uh, I, I could really use some oil for my tractor. Can I, can I borrow some oil? And being a good-natured guy, he said, sure. Then a woman came by, and she said, uh, look, I don't want to take your oil, but I don't know what else to do. I need to ask for your help. I'd like some oil to keep my family warm. Could I borrow some oil? And he said, sure. By the end of the month, the tank in the lighthouse had run dry. And that night, that beacon was so dark that three ships crashed on the rocks. More than 100 people died. You say, why? Not that these things weren't important, but they weren't the most important thing. So you help the farmer and you help this person and at the end of the story, a hundred people died because you ultimately didn't do your one job. You didn't keep the first thing, the first thing. What's your priority? Look, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm convinced by talking to Christians. I'm convinced that for most Christians, it's job, money, family, God, church, or church, God. <laughs> Somewhere like that. You see how you know? By how they spend their time. By how they spend their money. By how they spend their energy and their passions. <laughs> What's your priority this morning? Look, I'm going to tell you something real quick. This life is going to be here and then gone. You know, I, like, I love history. And I, I drive my wife crazy sometimes. We'll drive through the, a beautiful area in the country. And she's look, taking all the sights in. I go, oh, look at that house. I wonder who lived there. Oh, look at this. I wonder, don't you want, and I, I look at her, don't you wonder who lived there, how many kids they had? And Jesus looks at me like, no, not at all. And some of you are thinking, no, I wouldn't either. I did, but I do, I think about that. And the reason I, I'm, I'm just, I'm drawn to think that way is that I think about how during that time in their life, the most important thing to them was that home. And now they're gone. 
And that house is dilapidated. And it, no one knows who was there. That, their mark, as far as the world goes, was like this. Don't you want to do something that matters for eternity? <laughs> Learn to sacrifice. It shows your priority. Let me say this about a more excellent sacrifice. Abel could have looked at Cain and said, well, he's taking fruit and he's doing this. I'll just do what he's doing. Look at verse number 5, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse 5. This they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. You say, what do you get out of that? It is a personal choice. You know what I can do? Look, preachers do it all the time. They beat people, they beat people. They, you got to do more, got to do more, got to get more, got to get more. Gotta, yeah. and, and people just get, guilt people into doing things. That is not what this is about. <laughs> And this is not about a manipulation of your emotions and uh, we're going to have this big raw, raw conference and make you feel like dirt because, you know, you don't give $1,000 a month to missions. That's not what this is about either. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to, to rile you up and to try to manipulate your emotions, but I'm trying to get you to understand this is a commitment. You sacrificing yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ is a personal commitment. When's the last time you said, Lord, what would you have me to do? At my home. What would you have me to give to my family? What would you have me to give to my church? Or how would you have me to serve here? The Bible says over there in Isaiah, the Lord is speaking. He says, who will go for us? Isaiah's answer is, here am I. Send me. That's how you know Isaiah wasn't a Baptist. If Isaiah was a Baptist, he would have said, Here's Brother St. John. He's a great teacher. Uh, you know, uh, uh, here's uh, Brother Justin. He's really good at media. You know what we like to do? Oh, man, that person, I really think they're called there. Wonderful. I'm glad you think they're called to that. <laughs> you know, I, I really think, they, Lord, they should, in a message like this, you look around the room and go, yeah, that person's not using their talents for the Lord. Don't do that. Let's make this personal. What are the things in your life, in your hands, in your heart, that can be offered to Jesus Christ that you're holding on to. You know what Paul says? When you first get saved, what wilt thou have me to do? Look at verse number 8, same chapter, verse number 8. Now, here's something that some of you may not, maybe you don't like this, but I'll, I'm going to level it to you this way. You ladies that are here, your husband says he loves you, right? You ladies that are married, can I get an amen on that? Amen. All right. Now, let, let's just say that your husband says that he loves you, but he spends more time with another female. How would you feel about that? Yeah, yeah. I said, Miss Sarah, I'm not letting you get away with it. Everyone got, she goes like this. That was great. All right. Now, now how would you feel if he's, he's, he, your husband says he loves you, but he doesn't want to talk to you? Kids, would you, would you feel that your parents love you if every time you went to talk to them, they were just... They're not listening. You know what's wrong with, another thing that's wrong with our generation? I see it all the time. Kids in public trying to get their parents' attention, and the parents are like this. Whew. <laughs> Drives me crazy. I want to sometimes grab that phone and just throw it against the wall, <laughs> you know, and just see what the parent does. I have a feeling they'd probably get arrested, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the point is, there are ways to prove your love for people, and you do it through communication, and you do it through giving. And there are different expressions of that love. But I want you to see in verse number 8. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. And look at this. And to prove the sincerity of your love. You say you love the Lord? I love... What's the first and great commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy soul and thy mind. And the second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Sometimes, I think because we rightly divide so well as independent Baptists, we forget that's still the first and great commandment. Love him with everything you got. Do you love him? What are you willing to give him? How much time will you spare him? You know, the book of James says it like this. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, please understand the context doctrinally of James as to the twelve tribes of Israel. 
But practically, as a Christian, and I, I wrote about that in the, your bulletin that you have, you know what you get out of that? As a Christian, as a Christian, what you see is that you are to prove all things. You say you love the Lord, prove it by what you do for Him. Prove it by what you give to Him. Lord, I love you. I'm willing to sacrifice some time in the morning. I'm willing to sacrifice some popularity. I'm willing to stand alone with you. Lord, I'm willing to give you. And Lord, I, I honestly, I, I'd like to have more of my budget to go on vacation this year, but I'm going to take that budget and go on a missions trip and help a missionary. Lord, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to do this with my life, but I'm going to give this to you instead. You love them? I'll tell you right now, if you ever hear of me going on a cruise, you will know how much I love my wife. <laughs> that, is, that is something I don't want to do. I may do it someday because I love her. I will pray a lot. I'll ask you to pray a lot in the process. Christian, what are you willing to do that maybe seems fanatical to the world to prove that you love Jesus Christ? He says here in this passage that their giving, as they said that they would, was proving the sincerity of their love. When you hear someone say, I love missions, we're a missions-minded church. I want to see people get saved. Do you want, you want to see people get saved? Amen. If you say, I want souls to be saved, and you never open your mouth for Jesus Christ, I'm not saying you don't want it. I'm just saying you're not proving the sincerity of your love. If you say, man, I love what missionaries do. What a blessing. They give up life in America, and they go to these places, and they serve God, and they lead people to Jesus Christ, and they start these churches, and man, I just love what they do. But you never give to them. I'm not saying you don't love them. I'm just saying you're not proving the sincerity of your love. If you say, man, I love New Heights Baptist Church. And I, I'll be honest with you, I love my church. I do. I do love this church, and I love you people. But if I said I loved you, and I just decided, you know, on Sunday morning, I'm just not going to come. I'm not going to preach. They'll figure it out. You might doubt the sincerity of my love. Am I right or am I wrong? I, I think you might. Why? Because that's what is done. When you say you love something, you are committed to it. And, and I, 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 I am going to preach on this sometime soon, so I don't want to take too much of my future thunder away. But man, I'll tell you something that's missing from people today is loyalty. Loyalty to Jesus Christ Loyalty to a cause, loyalty to your church, and, and, and God forbid I say it, but loyal to the preacher. And I should be loyal to you. That's how it ought to be. If you, don't have, if you have a problem with that, guys, I'm sorry. You're not reading the same book I am. We are, we are called to follow. And there was a time in my life where I, and I am still following. And believe it or not, there are some of your examples that I am following now. There's some loyalty that's missing. You know why you know that? By what's given. By our time. I'm loyal to Jesus Christ. Are you? There's a pattern that you're to follow here. Look at verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Look, you're not left without an example. The Lord's not asking you to do something he didn't do already. I want you to see there in verse number 14. You know how God works this thing out. God works it out so that those that are called to preach, and he maybe gives the ability to, to go ahead and preach, they're doing that. And those that are, that are able to teach a Sunday school class, they're doing that. And those that are able to support missions, they're doing that. And those that are able to help with a visitation program, they're doing that. And those, you say, what, what happens? God brings a body together, everyone does their part, and it's a beautiful thing. You know what I tell our kids all the time? Hey, guess what? You are part of the Dominguez family. There are, there are jobs for all of us to do. All right? There is work to be done. And because of that work that everyone does, guess what? There's an equality. Everything gets done rightly. You know how this thing of giving goes and you being a sacrifice to the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're sacrificing what you can, and this brother in Christ is sacrificing what they can, and I'm sacrificing what I can, the Lord takes that thing and he blesses it. He says there in verse 14, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. 
that their abundance also may be supplied for your want, that there may be equality. Not even so much a matter of the equality of the gift, but equality in who is giving. Let me lastly say this. Look at verse 18. A more excellent sacrifice means we get to reap God's praise. We have sent within the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. The last thing you need to do is give to God to get a pat on the back from a person. But I'll tell you what you ought to desire more than anything else is to hear the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of all of this, at the end of life, at the end of the job, at the end of retirement, at the end of raising kids, at the end of maybe fighting cancer, at the end of whatever it is you're going to fight at the end of your life and face at the end of your life, at the end of all of it. You know what you need more than anything? You know what you want, you ought to want? Is to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know what I can do? I can say, thank you so much for teaching Sunday school. Thank you so much for helping in nursery. Thank you so much for coming to visitation. Now, I, I can thank you, and, I, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I can tell you right now, that is nothing compared to hearing the Lord say, great job, son. As he reaches out, <laughs> nail prints in his hand, and you know what you say? We're not worthy, and you fall at his feet. And he says, I want to share my glory with you. Here's a crown. That is something that you cannot capture in this life. And I'm trying to get you to see, Christian, that a more excellent sacrifice is one that impacts eternity. It's one that at the end of all of this, you get to the end, and you hear the Lord say, well done. Paul says it like this about Epaphroditus. But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Back in our passage, it says that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. And it says that God testified of his gifts, and he pleased God with it. Christian, I don't know where you're at, but I pray that you are convinced that being a living sacrifice and putting yourself on the altar is where the Lord would have you today. And I've heard many times before, the problem with a living sacrifice is it's always trying to crawl off the altar. Amen? And that's the problem we have. Maybe you need to stay there a little bit. Offer up to the Lord more excellent sacrifice by faith. Let's all stand. Let's all stand.